Hey there. Um, I want to get back into Colossians, and I might just wrap it up. Um, the thing is, is with Colossians 3 and 4, we're getting into what's called the, everybody calls the practical admonitions. And uh, there's not a whole lot to speak to um, because in most cases, uh, I, I mean, I would say most of the cases that of people that are listening to these messages, they don't have a situation where this even hardly applies. Um, it's they're not in a church life, a real church life. Um, what Paul's speaking to assumes that everybody he's talking to is in a fellowship where they all have this actually have the gospel right. <laughs> uh, so, um, hold on, let me pull this up. And I'm sorry, I have not done much teaching. I've, I'm right at the peak of busy wedding season. My weekends are full. Uh, it's just been a real busy time. Uh, but I can tell you what this is not. It's not a list of practical things to do to improve yourself as a Christian. None of these admonitions in uh, chapter 3 and 4 have anything to do with individual Christian life uh, per se because they're all they're all attitudes if you want to call it that towards the body of Christ um, and it's not the body of Christ at large it's supposed to be towards people that you know um, and we talked about how this is, uh, let's see, we talked about how based on being complete in Christ, there's these warnings of not being taken off as spoil and, uh, to see the difference between the heavenly and the earthly. The heavenly, we're supposed to set our mind on things above. And above the heavenly things is where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Now, the only way we know anything about heavenly things in order to hold them in our mind, where Christ is seated, we're not talking about what angels. Some people think heavenly things are the principalities and angels. And this spirits rolling over that city and we got to rebuke it you know the nar they think they're dealing with heavenly things no they're dealing with the elements of the world uh and they're dealing with fallen angels and spiritual what they think is spiritual warfare and they spend all their time yelling at principalities and and, and wasting their lives in church meetings prophesying and yelling at principalities <laughs> and they think that's heavenly no to set your mind on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God um, is far above all principality and power. Remember Ephesians 1 says God raised him uh, th there's a power towards us which God operated in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him in his own right hand in the heavenlies far above all rule and authority and heavenly, uh, and, and every name that is named, or every principality and power, rule and authority, or principality and power, same, same words, every name that is named both in this world and the world to come, uh, it's above everything, and in that sphere, so-called, at the right hand of God, what is there? Well, it's Christ, and it's every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And it's specifically the riches of Christ for our inheritance. Heavenly things are related to Christ. When he says, set your mind on things which are above, uh, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, he's not talking about angels. He's not talking about anything other than what we have in Christ as an inheritance. 
And the way we know about these things and the way they enter our mind and our affections, the only way is through the gospel. Not through dreams, not through visions, not through some mystical experience, but through the word of uh, Christ which, is announce which announces them. And that word is the ministry of the New Testament, the epistles especially, but really all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. And it's who God is, what he's accomplished in Christ. It's the word of Christ. Um, and it centers on what is the result of the death, of re death and resurrection of Christ and what we have in him. And that is our life. So, if you therefore be risen with Christ, seek the things which are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your affections on the uh, uh, things above and not on the earth beneath. For you died, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. When uh, Set your affection on things above and not on the uh, things of earth. For you're dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then you will appear with him in glory. And we talked about how seeking what we have in Christ is in contrast to uh, seeking um, to be completed by anything else. And it's a recognition that we're already complete in Christ, and he's our life. And even though it's hidden and we don't see it yet, we know by faith that we're complete in him and we have everything in him who is the head of rule, all rule and authority. Remember he said, uh, let no one carry you off as spoil through his philosophy, empty deceit, traditions of men, elements of the world and not according to Christ for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him who is the head of all rule and authority or principality and power. Hold on, I can blow up my nose. I'm sorry. Uh, give me a second. <laughs> Whenever I, um, I have allergies really bad and we have dogs and cats in this house. So some people hate when I sniffle, but if I do messages in the house, it's just what happens. <laughs> And don't start giving me all kinds of advice about, you know, what to do. <laughs> Everybody's got advice. Um, sorry. Anyway. So then mortify your deeds of your body on the earth. We talked about that. So that's talking about just sinful practices, although it is. It's talking about your desire for manifestation of your spirituality in this life. And what is the temptation? A lot of times it comes from uh, the accusations of people around you that you don't show what, uh, if you were a Christian, if you were really good, if you were really something spiritual, if you really knew God, you would look a certain way, you would behave a certain way, you would live a certain way, uh... And so then you are tempted to um, follow rules. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Um, or follow cultural things to be associated with groups of people, which is according to class and culture. You know, and the best example I know is that I'm, from my personal experience is when I was with that Chinese church for 10 years, uh, the Caucasians that survived it adopted Chinese mannerisms, which was considered to be in the spirit. The way the, the Chinese thought American culture was loose and carnal. Our sense of humor, our candidness, our forthrightness, uh, our loudness was considered vulgar. Uh, it was considered um, loose. It was considered fleshly, unspiritual. And so, after a while, you would see uh, 
Oh, also, you know, the way we eat and everything. I mean, everything. So you would start to see people who did well in the in that church life who were Caucasians, who eventually, if you saw any of them recognized as position of authority or anything like that, they acted just like the Chinese. <laughs> their mannerisms were the same. Their dress was the same. Their eating habits were the same. They were skinny. They were quiet. They rarely laughed. They didn't joke around. Uh, they didn't act like the Americans, that's for sure. And you know what? I mean, that I went to a, a church for a while where it was a mix. It was at the center of our city uh, where there were a bunch of rich white people, but there were also a bunch of uh, inner city uh Black people, and we we have a very segregated city. It's amazing that this church catered to both. Um, that's pretty commendable, actually. But it was like the Greeks and the barbarians. The cultures were so different. Uh, that, uh, you know, I'm not trying to say anything racist, but I'm just saying there's a dramatic difference in culture. And what if subconsciously we were putting expectations on, uh, you know, the perception, okay, there, there, there's a white people church culture that looks nothing like black people church, cult, church culture. Now, these are not, when I say church culture, there's no such thing. It's culture. There is white people culture. And white people go to church and they act a certain way that they think is spiritual. And then there's a black culture and they go to church and they act a certain way that they think is spiritual. But it's just culture. It's just, you know, and there's nothing wrong with culture. But when you measure other people by that culture so that they start having to feel pressured to behave differently then they would naturally behave in order to be perceived as spiritual or complete in Christ, and it becomes a problem for their conscience, now it's an issue. And especially if you start teaching according to your culture. You know, Witness Lee and these guys, there was a guy named, somebody who reminded me, Manoral Chan was one of the teachers who was well-respected in the Chinese group. Uh... And he taught that the he he was a very strict Chinese, and he got five hours of sleep a night. And he said, "You're lazy if you sleep more than five hours a night." I mean, th this was his teaching, you know. Uh, that that's cultural, you know. But he turned it into a whole spiritual practice of, and you know grab psalms that talk about rising early in the morning to meet the Lord and all these things and bro broke it into, uh, grouped it into their morning devotional practice and you were required to be considered a functional member in the church life to be uh, on the phone in the morning at about 5 o'clock or 6 in the morning with a brother or a sister doing what they called morning morning manna, morning devotional. Now, we didn't really practice that that much at our church. We tried for a while, but it was expected that before you go off to work, you already had a half-hour devotional with the brothers or sisters, if not in person, then on the phone. <laughs> and they had uh, this fit into their culture. Uh it would it ran contrary to our culture <laughs> sorry again it's not wrong per se but it's not christ see you're carried off as spoil and the reason you know you're carried off as spoil is because incrementally all these things add up to a system that tell you that if you're doing well in that system you're satisfying to Christ and worthy to serve and blessed. And if you're not, you probably have a problem in your fellowship. 
and you live under condemnation. And the happy people are the people who think they're doing well. And the miserable people are the people who don't. And none of it has anything to do with Christ. Uh, Okay, so this is culture. And people fall prey to culture, cultural uh, ideologies or whatever, because they don't have a vision of who they are in Christ, because they haven't learned to reckon themselves dead. They still think they're under performance. This is a little different than just law righteousness. This is the old man with his culture. I keep, I've said culture like 56,000 times in this message, right? Uh, but that's really the essence of what he's getting at. There's a spiritual culture in the NAR uh, and the charismatic circles that produces people saying, the Lord showed me this and the Lord told me that and the Lord told me this and the Lord told me that. Do they really mean the Lord told me? No. In most cases, they don't. It started with, I was praying about it, and I felt like, this is what I'm going to do. Okay? I had a piece about that. It started with, I had a piece about that. But even that came from the culture. I mean, I remember we used to say, I had a piece about that. Or I got a check about that. I have a check about that. I got a piece about that. What is that? That's that's you're picking it up from people around you, and you're learning to be say, say what's acceptable, without really understanding what you're talking about. How do I know I have a check about it or the piece about it? Does it have anything to do with Christ? No, it's you know up for grabs. I didn't know we had freedom back then. I thought God, you know, micromanaged our life. And we didn't have the ability to choose anything in our life, like no preferences. And but eventually, the more spiritual people started saying things like what the Lord told me. (laughs) You know, I I didn't just have a piece about painting my house purple. The Lord told me to paint it purple. Well, then everybody started wanting to say that. You know, the Lord told me. The Lord told me. Uh about such inconsequential things, you know. Now, we do get a sense sometimes about, okay, you know what? That job just doesn't feel like that's the one I'm supposed to take. I, I get a... I, the way I look at leadings in my life... I'm all over the map, sorry. But how do you know you're being led by the Spirit? That's another one. Led, I'm led by the Spirit. I'm not going to do anything unless I'm led by the Spirit. My concept about being led by the Spirit is 100% different than it used to be, but uh, being led by the Spirit used to be about how do I know whether I'm supposed to go to Walgreens or Walmart? What if I choose Walmart and I was supposed to go to Walgreens because I was supposed to witness to someone there and now I've missed God's purpose in my life? (laughs) That's the T... That was the teaching, you know, we were under. We need to seek God's will for our life. It's Christless. No, the will of God is that we would see how central Christ is in everything and how God, everything is being done in Christ and Christ is preeminent in all things and all the fullness dwells in him and we are rich in him, we're complete, we have everything and we're not missing it. You know, we're in plan A. The will of God is that we would see the sovereignty of God so that we'd be free to make choices. (laughs) Um, If somebody's mad that we say that uh, God's sovereignty and our free will exist together, he said, you know, well, no. Uh, The beauty of it is that I know his sovereignty is there and I can make choices and know that he's got me. You know, but these leadings, the way I look at it is we have a green light unless we have a yellow light or a red light. Most of his leadings in my life, if you want to talk about a leading, have been restrictive where like in book of Acts, it says 
Paul was forbidden to go into Bithynia, that he wanted to go into Asia, and the Spirit of Jesus forbade him. There's just a sense that I can't. There's times when I cannot teach. No matter how hard I try, there's just nothing. And that's not even a decision I'm making. I mean, it's literally, I can tell I can't teach. It's been like that the last couple weeks. Uh, where just very little bit comes out, and it's not really my choice. Um, but, for the most part, it's a green light. You know, he's not controlling everything you do and inspecting it for approval. Uh, it, as long as you have a good conscience. When it comes to being led by the Spirit of the Lord, the the passage we have is in Romans 8, where it says, those who are being led of the Spirit of God are the children of God. For you've not received a spirit of bondage again to fear, but a spirit of sonship, in which we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself witnesses with our spirit that we are children of God and heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. This leading of the Spirit has to do with the witness that we are heirs and that we have everything to get in Christ and the, to recognize the sonship and the father's voice in contrast to the spirit of bondage and fear. It's, it's, it's exactly what we're talking about. The leading of the spirit is to lead you into the acknowledgement of the riches of Christ, of the mystery of God, which is Christ. All the comforts that come from the full assurance of understanding unto the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, which is Christ. It's exactly what Paul's talking about. To know the will of God is Christ, and that I'm complete in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. All the fullness of the Godhead dwells in bodily, him bodily, and I'm not going to be carried off as spoil because I've not been given a spirit of bondage and fear. So it's my fears of not being accepted and missing out and not being complete and not being approved that lead me to be spoiled in your cultural system of error to do the dance with you and lose my crown, which is my assurance and my joy, um, because in that system, the Father's voice is so muted that I don't sense the witness of the Spirit saying, Abba, Father, and I'm a child of God. Um... Then you're not led by the Spirit. You're being controlled by Satan and men and their systems. Uh, so leading of the Spirit is not about what you're going to do. Leading of the Spirit is the renewal of the mind to set your affections on things above and see your death with Christ on uh, concerning things below. What does it mean I'm dead with Christ to mortify my members? means I no longer, I'm not responding to the carrot and stick of a wage slave. I'm not responding to the manipulation and the pressure and the fear of a slave. I'm responding to the upward call, Abba Father, and the fellowship and the joy I have in Christ. Okay, now ideally... This is the environment of the church. This is the atmosphere of the church and the fellowship. That Paul labored that the atmosphere that we would have that we have in our supposedly have in our heart in Christ with the Father would be our atmosphere with the saints. And this is what Satan's attacking all the time. He does not want the body of Christ to be built up. So that the atmosphere on earth actually matches the heavenly atmosphere. And in that case, <clears throat> it's better to be isolated. And know what the church is theoretically. Than to be, unless you're called to it, in the midst of that environment. If you can't separate yourself from the dance and you lose your joy and your peace because you cannot overcome 
uh, the, the music that's being played out there. I could not overcome in the Chinese church. No matter how much I knew about what I had in Christ, when I went to go be with the saints, they brought me, they're just their frowning faces. The, the elder's wife, she had a way of expressing disapproval by saying, Oh, Lord Jesus. <laughs> And every time I got up to speak, that's what she would say. Because she had to speak at all the meetings. Everybody was required to speak. <laughs> he would say, you know, Dave, you have anything? And she'd go, oh, Lord Jesus. <laughs> oh, it was so hard. Uh, at that, I mean, this is when I was in my late 20s, early 30s, which was really young, you know, I mean, to me now, I know that's really young, um, and, uh, yeah, that's all culture, that culture killed me, spiritually speaking, um, so that's kind of what we're talking about here, is the, the, the culture in Colossae, uh, and I'm not the first person to say that, that Coloss Colossians is a book about Christ versus culture. Uh, it's a religious, mystical, and philosophical culture that's very difficult to overcome, that they're being confronted with. And the only way to overcome it is to see how complete you are in Christ and see your death with him and really be renewed all the time. Um in the knowledge of what you have in him. Okay. So then he talks about, and we've talked about all this, you know, mortifying your members on the earth. And we talked about how the uncleanness and everything is really about, uh, the, the evil desire that lurks in your members that causes you to be drawn to the religious dance or to being carried off as spoil. And it's also working in the members of those who are carrying you off into spoil. They want to make a show of you in the flesh. Uh, and that's why the the wrath is coming on the children of disobedience. And we think that's just out in the world. No, it's really... Uh, when you see that there are tares among the wheat, people who are in here specifically... To carry people off as spoil and do as much damage to the body of Christ as possible. And that and they present themselves as ministers. And their entire ministry is fueled by bitterness and hatred for the saints and for the doctrine of Christ. These are the children of disobedience. He's not really just talking about the world in general. Uh consistent in all Paul's letters and in Peter and Jude when they talk about the wicked and the ungodly who are speaking against God and everything they're talking about the ones right up in your face uh, when Paul talks about in Thessalonians you know he's going to in f flaming fire uh, reveal himself and, and bring vengeance on the adversaries who know not God and disobey the gospel he says he's going to give you rest in the day of Christ and affliction on those who trouble you. And he was talking about the Jews at the time who spend all their days in the scripture to find new new ways to persecute the saints and bring accusations and lies against them that they're apostate, uh, antinomian, uh, greasy, uh, heretic, you know, cult members. It wasn't the Romans at large at that time that were bringing persecution to the saints. It was the it was the God instituted by biblical religion of the day, and it's the same today. It's the ones with the Bible in the hand and the most scriptures, uh, and two thousand years of commentary stacked up in their favor, supposedly that are the children of disobedience that are going to be part of the hardened branch that's cut off, the Gentile branch, that because they received not the love of the truth, took pleasure in unrighteousness, will be delivered over to strong delusion, and will believe the lie. They're, they'll go after the false prophet. They'll be part of that whore system. They'll be judged with fire. 
Uh, judgment begins in the house of God, and the, there's vessels of wrath that he has tolerated um, who are ordained to destruction. And they're already showing it in their works and their doctrine and their teaching that they are in darkness. They hate the brethren. They've taken the way of Cain. Okay, these are not your average guy down the street who voted for Biden and he drinks every night and watches football. He's got an alcoholic problem and he cusses all the time. That is not who Paul is talking about when he talks about the children of disobedience. I mean, these words what he uses when he talks about the wrath of God. God is not angry at the world just generally because of sin. No, it's the when God's wrath is kindled. If you read the prophets, it's because of people who represent his name and his word, who take up his word as a lie. Um and make him out to be Satan. Anyway, so that's the children of disobedience. <laughs> a little bit of another tangent, right? Uh but he says, you used to walk in these things when you lived in them. Um, but, you know, the world at large does live in these things. Uh, but now, you also put off all these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy. Okay, we talked about this. The, the, where is this coming from? He said they were doing so good. Well, when you're being spoiled, or when you're in danger of being spoiled, it's because you think you lack something. So he's really trying to show them they have everything in Christ. And when you think you lack something, that becomes the source of jealousy, envy, bitterness, strife. Just like in Galatia, they had been moved away from him who called them into the grace of Christ to another gospel, which was not another gospel, only there were some seeking to trouble them, perverting the gospel of Christ by bringing them into bondage to law. And now they were seeking those people's favor and they were becoming jealous of the ones who had it and envious and provoking one another he said and he said beware lest you be, uh you bite and devour one another be consumed of each other it gets worse and worse so the anger and the wrath starts to come out in the relationships you know when i was in that church life we all pretended to love each other, but we couldn't stand each other because there was all this, uh, you're on a performance treadmill and everybody's racing against each other and no one wants anyone to succeed because if that person succeeds, then I'm a failure. It's awful. We're not in this together. We're not qualified for a share. Like he said at the beginning of the epistle, we're a qualified for a share of the allotted portion or the inheritance of the saints in the light. We're supposed to all be enjoying something that we have together, the inheritance. But when you think you've got your own thing that you got to hoard and hold on to, it becomes a source of grasping, jealousy, envy, and pride, and wrath, and discouragement, and disappointment, and anger, uh, depending on if you think you have it or don't, right? Okay, uh, so that's all old man. The culture belongs to the old man, and old man is Adam. So he says, lie not to one another. And lying, lying here really has to do with pretending to be something you're not. Uh, seeing that you've put off the old man with his deeds. When did we do that? When we were buried with Christ. Because Christ crucified the old man. Now, the old man is not just you. Uh, the old man is the entirety of the Adamic human race. He is the last Adam, and he crucified it there. When we accept that God judged Adam, we realize he judged everybody. All died with Christ. That's God's judgment on the flesh. And what is the flesh? It is the totality of who we are apart from Christ. It's the whole creation. With its culture, which was developed independently of Christ, as men lived as orphans apart from God, trying to fend for themselves, and then established systems of identity based on their orphanedhood, <laughs> uh, based, you know, who's accepted, who's in, and who's out. Well, 
it's whoever um, pleases the people who have the most power or the most influence or seem closest to God or seem the most spiritual. That's the old man. But in the new man, it's not like that at all. In the new man, it's not based on that. It's all based on the blood of Christ and on his offering and on God's acceptance of Christ and our being accepted in the beloved. And there's no rank. In the new man, we are all fully qualified. It's not a pyramid scheme. There's no one to um, seek to have their approval in order, order to climb the ladder. That's abolished. So the source of the anger is gone. The source of the jealousy is gone. The source of lying to each other is gone. If we see that Christ is everything and we have everything in him. I'm not having to pretend for you because you got nothing I need or want. Um, okay. Have uh, We've put off the old man with his uh, deeds and we've put on the new man. Okay. The new man is a singular man. Just as the old man was Adam, the new man is Christ. But it's just not Christ individually. It's Christ and the church. The new man was created at the cross, according to Ephesians 2, uh, when he abolished the enmity, the ordinances, and he brought those who were near and those who were far into one body on the cross and reconciled them to God so that God and man became one in Christ, in his body. Uh, this is called the new man. The new man, the old man was just human. Just had man. The new man has God and man in Christ. He is the tabernacle of God. Uh, he's the meeting place of God and man. We are in him and God is in him and we're all one. And we have access in him to the Father. And all of us have equal access through him. Uh, that's the new man. Okay. So he says, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there's neither Greek or Jew, uncircumcision or circumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. That's how we know it's a, it's a corporate man. Christ is in a plurality of members in the new man. It doesn't say, but Christ is in you. It says, no, Christ is in all. And it's, there's no culture. Creek, Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free. What are these? These are distinctions of haves and have-nots. Distinctions of near and far. Uh, and each of them has its own characteristics that causes it to stand apart from the others based on behaviors and deeds that it views as acceptable or unacceptable. But they're just that. They're deeds and behaviors. They have nothing to do with the motives of the heart. See, the, the Chinese people view the Americans as being unspiritual, but had no way to see by our behavior because we were loud and obnoxious that we loved the Lord and that we genuinely desired to see the building up of the body of Christ. All right? And we saw them as austere and cold and strict, but had no idea, uh, no way to see that they loved the Lord because we couldn't see past their strictness, and they couldn't see past our obnoxiousness. So it's our deeds. He says, you put to death uh, the old man with his deeds. The, it's not motives. It's deeds. It's kind of interesting. Um, and these barbarian, Scythian, Jew, Greek, circumcision are, are outward things. Bond or free. Uh, they, are, they do not speak to the heart. Um, so, and again, like in that church when I was in the city, well, it was like a mix of city and county, you know, we couldn't see each other's heart. It is true. You, when you're with someone who is so alien to you in their behavior, 
it makes it very difficult to see their heart. So putting on the new man has to do with seeing past all these things and getting to the heart of things. Well, what's the heart? The heart is supposed to be the place where Christ is making his home. You know, it's not that I, he wants you to see my heart and I see your heart. You know, no, Christ is supposed to be making his home in our heart. Okay. Blow my nose again. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Christ is all and in all. See, that's the point. Can you see Christ? Now, this is the thing that Paul says in uh, Corinthians. How we used to know men according to the flesh, but now no longer. We, we used to know Christ according to the flesh, but now no longer. We don't know him just as the man from J Jesus of Nazareth of Galilee who died on the cross. That's how the Jews all knew him. They knew him according to Judaism. And they were trying to circumcise everybody and tell them, tell them according to the Sermon on the Mount that they had to keep the law. They did not know him according to the revelation of the mystery, that now he's the head of the body and the life of the church. In resurrection, he's the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Do you see him that way? You know, uh, So now he is the life and the man and the person of the new man. Uh, and we... He's talking about how do you see the body of Christ? How do you see the members? Because in, in 2 Corinthians, he says, okay, we used to know Christ according to the flesh. Now, no longer, <coughs> if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things are made new. Behold, all things are come out from God. And now he's going to start talking about relationships and how we're to interact in the body. Okay. Uh, for bearing, okay, so then put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. Now, there's the word elect, and I said that predestination has to do with our sonship. Elect has to do with your position in time as an instrument in God's purpose. And as an instrument in God's purpose, also foreknown, we're members of the body of Christ. We're not members of Israel, you know. Um, and we are, uh, to put on something that is not ours by nature, by default. And by the way, that's what the new creation is. The new creation flows out from God. Paul, Paul says, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things are, uh, made new and everything is out from God. And in the new creation, we see the new city, Jerusalem, in Revelation 19, which is the final revelation of the new creation. Um, and it's this golden city. And in the center, there's the throne of God and of the Lamb. And out of the throne of God and of the Lamb, there is a river of the water of life. And that river is the content of the city, the life of the city. And from it is all the virtue and all the power and all the strength and all the newness. And we're to live in newness of life. And the new man is renewed in the knowledge of him. The new man, uh, in Ephesians 4, he says, to, here it says we've put on the new man, which is renewed. In Ephesians 4, uh, it says, uh, sorry. And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in... Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man. Putting on the new man is a matter of renewal. Why? Because it's new. If you look at renewal and new in the Bible, in the New Testament, they're they're both related because they're both... Rela uh, both they're both connected because they're related to the nature of what we've received. New is something, you know, we talk about God is holiness. God is light. God is righteousness. God is love. Well, one of the things we should say is God is new. 
Newness is a quality in God that doesn't that is something that's uniquely his that we don't really understand. But new means always generating. Not something old. Not based on yesterday. Okay? He is. All of his power is fresh. Everything he is, is now. And everything that we receive from him is fresh, now, new, in its original power. Uh, it's coming out now. And when, when it talks about, you know, we're to walk in newness of life. We're going to serve in newness of spirit, not the oldness of the letter. It's always contrasted to the old. The oldness of the letter, the old man... And what's the old man? Well, the old man is always related to either the corruption that's in the world, which is death, entropy, getting waxing old, and it's it's related to something that was created, has been there for a while, and is fading away. It has no power to sustain or generate itself, but also it's related to a track record. When it talks about the oldness of the letter, it's talking about your performance, your merits, uh, your righteousness. You know, I'm doing what I do today based on my performance yesterday. That's oldness. You know, if uh, if you get all A's, then you know, and then you're qualified to do X, Y, Z. That's not newness. That's based on a track record. That's oldness. That's not how God's economy works in grace. Grace is renewing. There's, uh, when it talks about in Titus, how uh, we were called according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us, and it came to us through the washing, let's see, the washing of regeneration, the renewing of the Holy Spirit. The renewing is not according to works. It's according to his grace. Which means it has nothing to do with our merits and our capabilities and our limits and what we've obtained and attained to. It comes from God entirely based on Christ, which means sky's the limit. (laughs) Uh, Today does not have to be dictated by yesterday. You know, I went on a vacation with my wife a couple weeks ago and honestly it was horrible. All kinds of feelings of limits and this is just the way this is and I'm so tired of this and we always do this and I'm angry and I can't seem to get over it and and this is just the way that we behave and these are the things we fight about that's all oldness where you are assuming that it's always got to be this way you know but grace is no everything is based on Christ and everything is new today. It comes out from God. The new creation comes out from God as a supply from him. He's not asking me to cultivate a virtue. He's not asking me to cultivate uh, goodness, kindness of my own. He's at or learn how to do it. He's asking me to put on something that's from him through renewing. And what is renewing? To be renewed in the spirit of the mind is to to think on things above and to be uh, reacquainted with what I have in Christ and to put off the old, which includes acknowledging that I am not limited to my history and my track record. Something new could come forth today. Something new could spring forth today. You know, it may look all dead today. But he is the God of resurrection and he is life. And to walk in newness of life means I'm waiting on him who calls those things that are not as though they are and gives life to the dead. This is what faith is. Like Paul said in chapter 2, we were buried with him in baptism and and raised by faith in the operation of God who who, who, uh, raised him from the dead. That's how we're to live. Not only... uh, unto ourselves, but in the body of Christ. So he says, mortify your members and put off anger, wrath, malice, 
bless me. Those are the things that are on you. Your members are unclean, fornication, un, uh, filthiness, right? And and what's on you is malice, blasphemy, for, <laughs> filthy for communication. All these things were crucified by Christ. They all belong to the old man. They're all part of his flesh and his culture. And they're to be crucified and put off. How? By setting your mind on things above, which means what I have in Christ, uh, and being renewed by acknowledging what I have in Christ. Preach the gospel to yourself. No, I'm complete in Christ. This is not who I am. He terminated that at the cross. But it's not just who I am. And this is where I said we can we can marvel at this, but to practice it requires others who are also in the body of Christ. And many of us don't have that kind of situation. Um, this is not individual admonitions, really. Um, have put on the new man. You've put off the old man with his deeds. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge. See? Renewing comes through the knowledge. It's about the mind first. Where's the mind to be? Set on things above. What is that? The Christ and the gospel. The only way we can know the things above is Christ and the gospel. Uh, where there's neither Jew, none of these distinctions. So why are you thinking according to these limitations? Oh, that guy's closer to God than I am. He's more spiritual than I am. People like him more. He has better culture and pedigree. He's going to do better than I am. No. You know, <laughs> no. Uh, put on therefore as the elect of God holy and beloved yeah, okay you know what this message it's, I haven't talked in a while so I'm, I'm all over the map but there's people who are believers who get kind of close to us who like the ministry at first but then as they go with us they get jealous of certain people they get jealous of me if they get into a chat room like a chat room. I'm not in it as much anymore because I just, just, I'll probably be in it again, but I'm in and out. Uh, but there was a time when the chat room was kind of new. There were like 50 people in there. Too many. And everybody was asking Bible questions and I was giving them the answers in there. Uh, now, these people had been listening to my channel for four, three years before they came into this chat room. Of course, they're expecting me to give them the answers to their Bible questions. They've been feeding from this ministry for three years. That's why they're there. Well, there was someone in there that was absolutely infuriated. And they would come in and, and they would try to answer, but their answers were not all that great. They weren't solid, scripturally. And they were often ignored. They would wait. Some of these are kind of newer believers who would wait to see what I would say. Now, we shouldn't have respect to persons by that. We should we should wait to see what's in the word. You know, who's who but not everybody knows the word, you know. So there was just respect for me as a teacher. And this person was taking somebody aside and I don't know why they didn't listen to him. Who does he think he is? And it got worse and worse. To the point where they were accusing me, he's a psychopath and a cult leader. And, I mean, it was just out of control. And they went on a rampage. And now they're one of the people rampaging. And I heard, I finally heard some of the audios of these uh, things they were saying. While they were pretending like everything was fine. Why were they doing that? Because they wanted a position in this community. Whether they're a believer or not. Uh, sometimes I wonder. But they seem to have the gospel right. But they were motivated by all this other stuff. They wanted to be respected. And they were infuriated that I seemed to be respected. It's like, man, I've never been respected in my whole life. I I have, I, you know, and, and I mean, I, nobody ever thought I had anything to say. That's true. And, and you know what? When I'm in my normal life, I don't tell people about a YouTube ministry. They have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just me. No one has any respect. He, oh, he's a musician. You know, uh, there's nothing to be jealous of, of here. This guy's got a YouTube channel. Big deal. <laughs> really, it is not that big of a deal. 
We were fighting over crumbs. Uh, but th this is oldness. You know, there is a time when God... See, that's the thing is that God does sometimes raise somebody up and use them. Uh, because he's prepared... He, he's prepared me for this time to, to speak to who I need to speak to. There's some people that are just really inf infuriated by that. And that motivates a lot of things. And it simply comes down to they don't see that they're complete in Christ. They think they're missing something. And so instead of putting on Christ, they get all offended in the flesh and start a campaign. And they, they, the, the, the accusations that I'm a cult leader come out of this and the fact that they can't turn people against me is one of the the next reason they call me a cult leader is because they can't get other people to see the same thing about how evil i am that people listen to me so when people say no everything he's i i agree with him is from the word then they say well see he's charles manson these people seek offense just everything he says they just hang on they, they will not turn against him He's that got absolute control over them. See, <laughs> their mind just gets, it gets worse and worse. What is that? It's the old man. Now, some of them are children of disobedience that hate the word. But some of them are believers and it's just, they literally, they have, they've been, they carry themselves off as spoil. They don't know how to, the first thing about putting to death the members on the earth. And all of them would be a wreck in a church. Now, some of them would do really well in institutional churches in a negative way. They'd be working in the church office, favorite of the pastor, and absolutely stomping on people in the church. And I met plenty of those people in the institutional church. They were the worst ones. They were the ones who, the pastor usually wasn't that bad. It was the people around him that had gotten there by flattery. Um, who absolutely did the most damage to believers uh, while flattering the pastor and pretending like everything was fine. Uh, and they were motivated entirely by greed and selfish ambition because they didn't see that they had everything in Christ and they looked at everybody as a threat to their territory. Okay, sorry, that... Uh, the, this is all that all comes from the old man, right? But the new man uh, comes from not from thinking that that's another thing is that these people, all of them are really good at operating in false mercy, false humility, false kindness, and false meekness and long suffering. Better, it looks more humble than the real thing. The real thing doesn't look as spiritual, humble, kind and long-suffering as what they're putting on as a facade. It's one of the reasons why people don't recognize the real thing is because the phonies have over-dramatized the act to the point where people expect that that's what you look like. And these people have this act of being so gentle and kind. And, oh, you know, I mean, it's gross the way they talk. And it's white people church culture for the most part. It wouldn't fly uh, in other cultures. <laughs> but it works in white people. It, it, it's the southern belle when she says, oh, bless his heart. What she means is I hate you. <laughs> you know, that guy's an idiot. Bless his heart. Okay, that's what it is. Um, it's culture. But we're trained to believe that that's what this stuff looks like. And it comes from thinking that you actually have it. They've deceived themselves into thinking that they're that way, but really it's a mask for all this evil ambition. So we do have to recognize what the flesh is. All this comes down to is judging, again, the old creation for what it really is. Do you judge the old man in the flesh? Do you see that the flesh is the uncleanness, the lasciviousness, uh, or I'm sorry, the uncleanness, the evil, consumiousness, the covetousness and the idolatry, or do you think um, that uh, really you're just seeking to serve God and have all he has for you?
Because that's how they would put it. I just want his best for me. You know, I'm just seeking, I'm seeking rewards. I want him to say, good and faithful servant, well done. That's how they cloak it. Do you, uh, do you put off wrath? Do you judge it? Uh, where he says, you know, put off, uh, sorry, lying, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. You know, that's just cussing. No. What have you been saying about Christ and what kind of accusations have you been bringing against the saints? That guy's just looking for a license to sin. He's a cult leader. You know, uh, <laughs> these people that believe in free will, they're, they're just a bunch of libtards. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Uh, do you think that that is virtuous speech? You know, is it sound? Is there any Christ in it? <laughs> Or do you judge it? Will you judge what you have and recognize, look, I don't have an ounce of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long suffering of my own. I have to put it on. I'm told to put it on here by renewing, by putting on the new man, which is of the new creation of God, uh, in which Christ is all in all, meaning it's not just me. It's there's, there's a, this belongs to a group of people and it comes from Christ and is Christ. And the only way to put it on is not to put it on as a virtue to perfect as if I own it, but to acknowledge that everything comes from Christ and to be raised by faith in the operation of God who raised him from the dead. It only works by the gospel, just like the rest of the Christian life. Lord, I can do nothing. I just want to make room in my heart for you and so I'm going to judge everything on the earth the way you judge it. I'm going to call it what it really is. It's dead. It needs to be put off. And I and make room for you, Lord, please. It's when Christ, who is my life, is manifested, then I will be manifested, not before. Uh, and I'm seeking you. Um, okay. I'm going to put it, I'm going to give it a rest. There's a lot more I want to say, but I, I need to give it a rest. Uh. I guess this is message 18. We'll probably get to message 20 and then we'll be done with Colossians. So, and then I think, uh, I think we're going to go into Hebrews and that one in a way is going to be easier. Uh, it's going to be more doctrinal, but it's going to be easier to talk through in some ways. All right, take care.